There we go. Okay. Charlotte Wright is seeing goldfinches in Bradenton. How fun. And we've got Judith from Sarasota and Barry Gerber from Sarasota. <laughs> Who is this? Heather, Heather Booth is coming from Rochester, New York, but not seeing any birds in the cold and snow. <laughs> oh, sorry about that, Heather, but I'm, we're glad you're here. Glynis Thomas, lots of ducks on our ponds. Mm, nice. Okay, Leah Wilcox, seeing black vultures in Sarasota. Kathy Doddridge is seeing robins arriving. All right. Harma is seeing tons of white pelicans. All right. And welcome David Harper for your first meeting. Glad to see you here. Lori Hoppy in Lakewood Ranch enjoyed a stork today. I assume that's a wood stork. That all we'll find here, isn't it? Or she had a baby. Janet right? Paisley saw a Western Tanager. All right. Oh. <laughs> and a Magnolia Warbler in Sarasota. Very cool. Well done. Suzanne Dameron is seeing white pelicans at Crescent Lake and St. Pete. All right. Mm. Maureen from Haverford, Pennsylvania. She's got robins and cardinals at least. Good. Heather says she just left Sarasota last Tuesday. What a change. Yep. Pretty abrupt if you're flying. Okay. Lynn Pedlar, her first meeting too. Welcome. So glad to have some first timers here. I think you're going to enjoy our talk with Aaron tonight. Okay. Jane Rufo seeing a tufted titmouse in her backyard feeders. Good. Jane in the meadows. All right, Judith Tibalt saw a red-tailed hawk on the Legacy Trail, just north of Culver House. Oh, that's fun, red-tailed hawk. Don't see those as often. Alan Gardner's from Sarasota. Marianne Lilly is seeing white pelicans on Siesta Key. Joe Price, hi everyone on her first meeting. Okay, new member, love it. And she's enjoying her resident Sandhill Cranes in Venice. Jeff Humbarger from New York City Highline saw a dark-eyed junco. Ah, all that is too cool. The New York City Highline is amazing. Love the Highline, yeah. Yeah. Um, Lynn Sheldon, also her first meeting. Wonderful. Sandhill Cranes near the Meadows. All right. Sue Heron sees tufted titmice and last week's sighting of hooded mergansers. Oh, they're fun. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, this is great. We have oh, yeah. <laughs> 84 participants here. So this is really wonderful. We're glad to have you all here. Um, let's see, Margaret Lanier painted buntings and goldfinches at her feeder. And another first timer, this is wonderful. Erica Timmerman, she's staying at Mayaka State Park. We're so glad you're back. And she's seeing great blue herons and spoonbills. All right. Okay, so we'll get started. I'm going to start with a little bit of, um, for those, especially for you first timers, welcome. And we are at Sarasota Audubon where we have so many of you attending. We do this as a webinar. So the only way we can talk is by chat or Q&A. And we ask at the end of the meeting for you, or during the meeting, if you want to put it then, we'll, we'll take the Q&A at the end, but it really helps us if you have a question directly for the speaker to put it in the Q&A, and that helps us keep track. Um, if you have anything logistics about the meeting, you can put that in in the chat, and I'm, I will be um, watching that all for the meeting. So I will, I will respond to that. Um, at any time you can submit your questions in the Q&A. Um, and I think that's about it. As time allows um, at the end, Aaron will answer questions and um, everything. Okay. Michelle Anderson says if you, there's a website and if you so if you look in the chat, you can, um, it will take notes for you with AI. That's really interesting. 
Oh, thank so you. thanks, Michelle. If anyone's interested, go to the chat and you can try it. Okay. Um, oh, we've got someone, Renee Beers is watching, is here from Jonathan Jickison State Park, which is on the other side of the state. That's right. She's mm -hmm. camping and seeing lots of scrub jays. That is awesome too. Alan Gardner says, help, no audio. I'm afraid it's your on your computer. And sometimes, Alan, if you restart and come back in, that might help. Um, okay. All right. So with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Jean and we'll start the meeting. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, December meeting. It's so wonderful to see you. It's wonderful to see um, and have new members come through. So welcome to Sarasota Audubon. And the, for this week, this month's news, I want to tell you that Pam Callender has uh, agreed to be our gardens consultant. You may remember that last month or just before the hurricane, we had engaged Kaylin Lowe to be our gardens manager, but unfortunately her house really suffered some damage during the hurricane and she then resigned. So we wondered what then we would do. <clears throat> and Pam stepped forward and is helping uh, Andy and other people in the gardens to get the gardens back in wonderful shape and she's working really hard at it. So welcome Pam. And we will be having some Saturday morning walks with Pam uh, for those folks who are interested in making their own gardens native. So stay tuned for that. Okay, next slide. Okay. Oh, the Christmas bird count. We're all excited about that. Um, Stu Wilson coordinates that. I know the teams are all organized for uh, this cycle, but he always welcomes sightings from backyard watchers. So watch what's in your backyard and report what you see to Stu Wilson at Comcast.net and have a wonderful count. Let's see, I think Stu said earlier this week that the last count, I, I forget the, all of the numbers, but I think we were 34 out of over 200, 2,600 counts or 2,400 wow. counts. So that we've got dedicated and experienced birders doing our CBC. So that's wonderful. And here's Sue Herring, who is in our uh, uh, lead docent, um, is looking for um, applications for a member art and photo show, as you can see. We put that in the last brown pelican. If you know anybody who has any interest in that, please have them get in touch with us. Um, Catherine Young is telling me in the CBC, yes, we were second in Florida out of over 60 counts. So that was great for the CBC. Thanks, Catherine, for that. Uh, in November, we had a members only event uh, Wednesday afternoon at the Nature Center. It was highly successful. We had over 40 people come by. We had light refreshments and a speaker. And it was a great uh, afternoon. And we're doing it, it again on January the 18th. And here's John Ryan, our wonderful John Ryan, who was with Sarasota Baywatch. He's going to um, tell us what's happening with the bay. We'll all be really anxious about that because of the red tide situation right now. So maybe he can clue us in as to what's happening. So um, you don't have to register for that, by the way. And last but not least, it's time to renew your dues. Over 200 people have already taken advantage of the, what will be a $5 discounted fee. In January <laughs> the 1st, it goes up to $35. So if you're interested in saving five bucks, there you go. So, and is that it for That's slides? It. That's, That's it, it for slides. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. At the end of the meeting, I'll come back and say uh, uh, good night to you but I do have a wonderful holiday season. So turning it over to Margie, who's going to introduce our wonderful speaker for the night. So thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker. 
for tonight, uh, CEO Aaron Virgin, who's running Save Our Seabirds, known as SOS, the very important institution here in Sarasota County. And Aaron will update us on the history to the current future plans for SOS, which is one of the biggest bird rescue facilities, wild bird learning centers, and living museums in Florida. And I think it's going to become more and more famous. So please listen carefully, especially because Aaron is in charge now. Uh, he's self described as the bird guy. And he has extensive background for almost 20 years in wildlife and environmental issues for nonprofits, including his previous short term tenor as philanthropy officer for Marine and Lab and Aquarium. Uh, before Aaron relocated to Florida over three years ago, he was serving as vice president of group for the East End, which is a conservation organization based in Eastern Long Island, uh, New York, uh, for the kind of, if for those who are from the New York area or know it well, it's kind of the Hamptons, which is an old beating ground of mine. Um, during this time there, he maintained an integral role in the adv advocacy, government policy and environmental outreach programs while expanding the organization's avian research and stewardship programs by focusing on the breeding productivity of piping plovers, lease turns, and osprey across Eastern Long Island. Uh, after Aaron finished his graduate work, he was hired by uh, the National Audubon Society and worked in several state and national leadership capabilities, capacities. Um, like his current role at uh, Save Our Seabirds, one of his uh, responsibilities for a while was executive director of the Theodore Roosevelt Sanctuary and Audubon Center um, in uh, what Oyster Bay, I think, in Long Island, uh, the organization's first songbird sanctuary in the country. Erin has a master's degree from Syracuse University and a bachelor's degree, both in environmental science. Um, his uh, BA is from State University of New York at Plattsburgh. Uh, Aaron is, is clearly a passionate birding guy, and we had a great conversation about uh, where you could go and really do some exotic birding. And, and so uh, I, he said he's an accomplished birding guy, and he's traveled throughout the world leading high net worth donor echo tourism trips during his time with Audubon. So I said, well, where's the most... Uh, unusual, fascinating or unusual place he's been. And he said, uh, Timbuktu. And Timbuktu is in Mali on the edge of the Sahara. And he was there, what, six months before the Muslims, Muslims unfortunately took it over and made it inaccessible. Apparently it's not a great birding spot, but hey, wouldn't you like to say you've been to Timbuktu to bird? There you go. <laughs> so I'm Put thrilled to uh, introduce Aaron, take it away. Thank you, Margie. You're welcome. All right. Hi, everybody. These Zooms are funny when you do the, um, there we go. When you do the webinar, because you can't hear anybody. And it's like you're talking into just a vacuum. So um, I, I'll start off by saying thank you. Thank you, Jean and, and Karen, of course, Margie, for, for having me. Um, I, I try to participate in these uh, Zooms when I can. I thought Terry Rich's Zoom last uh, week, last month was fa very fascinating. Um, I'm a data wonk and I love some of his, um, uh, his conclusions from all the different uh, Q and A he did with his census work. Um, and so I'll start off by saying um, I, I am uh, Aaron Virgin. I am a CEO of Save Our Seabirds and I'm not your normal CEO. And I'll explain why in a minute. Um, just a quick outline of the talk. I'll give you a little intro, a little more background on me, although Margie did a great job and um, pretty much covering my career to date. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, obviously, about um, SOS. Human and wildlife conflict is a big thing that we deal with, and I want to address that. 
We're going to talk about the past, present, and future of SOS, and of course, at the end, entertain any Q and A. I'd like to start off with this slide, um, and uh, it's not me, but uh, it's my son actually. And this is not the shores of Lake Ontario where I grew up. Um, it's the shores of, of uh, the Atlantic Ocean in Montauk, and. Um, I, I've never pushed birding on either one of my kids. I have a 15 year old daughter and a 10 year old son, but um, they both love to be outdoors and hike and that sort of thing. Um, but I show this picture because I've met so many birders, um, famous ones, uh, you know, not so famous ones and um, who have been birding, who are big listers. And they all tell me, oh, I was like three years old and my dad handed me my binoculars and I started listing. And, it cracks me up because I had a very different story. Uh, growing up, I had, um, you all know what this is, probably a gray cat bird. And when I'd be on my property walking my dog, we had about 40 acres in upstate New York, I would hear, and then I'd hear, Aaron! and I could never get a fix on the bird. Um, it was like the boogeyman. And as I got older, it didn't do me any better. I didn't feel any more comfortable. And so inadvertently, it's this bird that probably prevented me from being a birder, which those of you, when I use the term birder, and I am a pretty avid e-birder and birder in general, I guess self-proclaimed bird guy, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it was always going to happen. It just happened a little bit slower. So it wasn't until I was... Um, probably about 19 years old, hiking in the Adirondacks, that I actually uh, came across the bird that changed my life. But before that, I want to talk about um, Audubon. And Audubon is very near and dear to me. Not only did I work for Audubon and, and still have a pension with Audubon, um, which is kind of funny. Um, I, I Wherever I've lived, I've joined the Audubon chapter. And it was a great way to not only meet um, great people, but find out where the birds were, right? So Onondaga Audubon was my my First chapter, uh, I joined when I was in grad school at Syracuse, and Derby Hill Bird Observatory is really where I cut my teeth. Um, and, and people often ask me, like, you know, what's the, what's the best group of birds to start with? And I usually start with either waterfowl or hawks, because if you can't go to a hawk watch when there's a bunch of hawks flying over and really get the birding bug, then there's probably no hope for you. Um, same with New York City Audubon, a very active uh, participant when I when I worked for Audubon and lived in uh, both Manhattan and Brooklyn. Um, great birding spots, of course, Central Park, uh, Prospect Park, Jamaica Bay, um, very active leading tour trips for them. And then when I moved out to Oyster Bay, as Margie said, I, I joined uh, Huntington Oyster Bay Audubon um, and a uh, great group of folks as well. A lot of Christmas bird counts. Elias, where I lived uh, most recently in Eastern Long Island, Norfolk Audubon, where my office was on the East End. And of course, down here, I've joined um, our two chapters, Manatee and Sarasota. Um, and if Bob Clark's on, I, I probably owe Venice Audubon a, a check as well. So it's in the mail. Um, but it was this bird that really got me going. Um, it is a black-throated blue warbler. And I was hiking in the Adirondacks. I think I was 19, maybe almost 20 and hadn't really taken any serious ornithology classes. I'd taken some wildlife classes and my undergrad, I was gearing towards doing some type, something with wildlife management. And it was on this hike, I was by myself. I actually was with my dog at the time and I came across this black throated blue warbler and it was so striking. I'd never seen anything like it. And I was probably about 4,200 feet in the Adirondacks. And it was, it was burned in my mind. And when I got home, this was, this is before there was a eBird and, and a, a great website to look up photos. I went to a bird guide I'd had as a kid and the bird wasn't in there. So I went to the, the college library and I found uh, a beginner's bird guide thinking, you know, well, that, that's all I need. And I flipped through and again, I didn't find it. And I thought, well, either this was a dream or um, I don't know. So I gave the bookshelf one more look and I found the Peterson guide. And I, not only did I find this bird, and it's the white handkerchief and just the contrast with the cobalt blue and black. But I realized that in the East, there's over 35 different species of warblers. And I almost dropped the book because each one is more beautiful than the next, right? So that's what um, sent me on my way. And after I graduated, just as a real quick background, kind of filling in the blanks. 
for for uh, that um, my, my career here. I, I was hired at the Palisades Interstate Park Commission to basically run summer camps, nature centers, if you will, for camp kids that came out from the inner cities. And I had a lot of downtime um, and I did a lot of birding and a lot of my coworkers were birders. And it was just a great way to really, you know, uh, get out, hike around and go birding, um, which after that, I went to ESF. I got a degree in wildlife management, was all set to um, work for Fish and Wildlife Service, which I worked for them for about four months um, prior to graduating. And applying for jobs out in Montana and Idaho and, and thinking I would run these huge, wonderful bird refuges, but fate had a little something else in mind. And so we ended up, long story short, in New York City with a wildlife management degree and not sure what to do with it. I just started applying for entry-level positions with Nature Conservancy and Trust for Public Land. And Audubon called me back and they said, can you come in for an interview? So I drove down from Syracuse and they hired me um, because I had written two grants for my grad work and I was funded for those two grants. And they said, you'd be perfect in development. I had no idea what they were talking about. I never heard of fundraising being called development. I'm probably at this point, 24, 25. And I thought, okay, <laughs> I'll do whatever. I'm gonna work at Audubon. And when I came in on my first day, I thought for sure, whoops, sorry about that. For sure, I'm going to see all these legendary birders. And they weren't there. People like Frank Gill and um, someone we talked about earlier, who I wouldn't call him a legend. He's a legend now, but at the time we were on the same age, Andrew Farnsworth and, and Jeff Wells. And these people that, uh, again, legends to me because I'd, I'd read their papers and, and seen their work and they weren't around. They didn't work in that office. So I kind of was one of the few birders that would take people out on bird outings and whatnot. And it was it was a cool thing to do, great place to be. Um, but after about nine years, I decided, that, uh, or eight years, a, a change was in the works and Margie pretty much filled you in on my work with the group who's celebrating the 50th anniversary of this year. And Group for the East End is, if you can picture an organization that is part conservation foundation down here, and part, um, I guess, almost like um, Audubon, a state Audubon type um, facility, um, it, it, conservation organization as a whole, but we did um, advocacy work and we did some litigation as well. Uh, and I will say as a fundraiser, raising money to litigate is not easy. And in fact, in some cases you'll, you'll lose funders who don't wanna fund an organization. They think the money's going to lawyers. Um, and as, as advertised, I did work for Moat Marine. I worked for Moat for about nine months. Um, I was hired during the pandemic. Um, and let me tell you, fundraising, that was strictly all I did. It was very difficult. And if people hung up on the phone, there was no other way to really meet with them or talk with them or converse with them. It was very challenging. Um, fortunately, uh, once vaccinations became more prevalent, um, we were doing more meetings. My sole focus was raising money for uh, two things, um, the rescue side and the hospital. So two things that actually helped me in my transition to Save Our Seabirds, because at the time I didn't realize the Save Our Seabirds and the, and the hospital staff at Moat work very close together um, on a number of things. And so I've been at the CEO level now at, at Save Our Seabirds for uh, about a year and a half, came in on last August. And uh, during the time, we've tweaked our logo a little bit. We had a little bit more color, a little bit more blue, a little more pop. We've trimmed down our um, tagline, Rescue, Rehabilitate, and Release, the three R's. And there's our mission. And we're all about rescuing and rehabilitating sick and injured with the goal of releasing them back to their natural habitats. A lifelong sanctuary and specialized medical care are provided for those birds that cannot be released. And we use their stories to educate the public about avian conservation. And if you haven't been to SOS, please, please come bring a, bring a friend, a loved one, a, a child, grandchild. It's free admission. When we reopened, um, I kind of went back to the Pelican Man strategy. And when I read the archives and at his peak, before he started charging, he had over 100,000 people coming through the gates. And I thought, wow, that's amazing, 100,000 people. And I looked at uh, SOS's numbers before we closed the pandemic, and it was about half that. And I thought, well, 
<clears throat> what are the other reasons to charge? Um, it was my understanding and just speaking with people um, who, who had visited that they, they didn't understand the difference between SOS and MOAT. They thought we were the same organizations being between the, um, the, the two aquarium buildings. So what I was finding was a lot of people were put off having to fork out more money after they just spend 30 or $20 on a ticket. And so what we've noticed is this year we're about 112,000 people have come through and through donations alone and no admission fee were actually increased by about 10% the amount of money coming in. So to me, it's, it's instilling stronger public will and having people come in and enjoying uh, SOS. I've heard from a lot of families, they've never been inside, they've been to moat every year, they just never thought to, to come in here to pay the extra money. A lot of people told me that they, they couldn't because the, during the pandemic we weren't open. But another story I wanna share, I was recently on a boys and girls club after, after school panel about, it was a career day panel. And one of the kids just looked at me deadpan and goes, so what's the deal with birds? How come you're not trying to save the black rhino? Aren't they really rare? And I said, yeah, they are rare. And there's a lot of, a lot of birds that are rare too. And I said, you know, I asked the group, how many birds do you think are in the world? And we went around the room and it was like, you know, meaning how many species? 150, a couple of people said a thousand. And when I said 10,000 and of those, nearly 10% are, are either special concern, threatened or endangered, um, it blew them away. So they, they saw the point. And then when I brought up, I, I probably went a little bit too far, I brought up the canary in the coal mine and it described how miners used to bring canaries down the coal mine. They all, all their eyes just glazed over. They had never heard it. And so um, I like putting this in here just to tell that little story, but um, it's true. I mean, birds are such a wonderful indicator of our environment. and what we're doing, what we're doing good and what we're doing bad. Um, we can't lose, uh, lo lose that whole, um, that story there. And, and, and what we do at SOS is, is, is pretty integral because no one else does it. There's other rehabbers, there's other facilities, Wildlife Inc. and, and to the South, uh, the Southwest um, Wildlife Center of Venice, both do great work, both are partners of ours, but we're the only ones that solely do um, bird rescues, uh, rehab and, and release. And, and we're doing it with a, a veterinarian who I'll we'll talk about in a little bit. So yeah, we get 5,000 plus calls a year. We average about 15 a day and 1,200 birds typically will come in in a year. Now that's a big range, 1,200 to 5,000. And that's because some of the calls are, yes, just put the baby bird back in the nest. Or sometimes it's what we call catch and release. So we may send a rescue volunteer out there. And by the way, all of our rescues are done by volunteers. We share some volunteers with folks like Friends of the Pelican and uh, the, the Venice Center. Um, uh, Linda and David Ganass are a perfect example. They, they, they volunteer for both, all three organizations. Uh, our service area basically is Manatee in Sarasota County. However, we do take um, pelicans and other birds that have been hooked um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, from the Skyway up in Hillsborough County, it's not Pinellas. Uh, Pinellas is on the other side, it's Hillsborough that borders Manatee. And we do do transfers from um, the folks down in Punta Gorda, uh, Peace River, and also uh, Crow. And Crow is devastated uh, down in Sanibel. We actually took in last week two cormorants and we are on call whenever they need to have a transfer and we have the room, we will, we will take birds. So we are kind of working out of um, four or five counties at the extreme, but I would say 95% is coming from uh, Manatee and, and Sarasota counties. Uh, the second R is rehabilitate, pretty simple. Bird comes in, we assess it, triage. Um, it's put in, um, we'll consider an ICU, this intern behind her or some of our ICU bins. Uh, we can perform minor surgeries and minor needs to be um, you know, articulated because we do not have a full surgical suite. We are, our, our building was basically built in 1992. Um, there's been little done to improve it. Since we've had uh, Dr. Pasquarelli, we, we are adding equipment as we can, um, as we can make the room. We have birds in every room except the office. So we are definitely uh, kind of packed to the gills. And I'll talk more about that when we talk about future plans 
And then in order to rehabilitate, you really need strength training and transition. So when you visit SOS, you're, you're visiting the public side, you're, you're seeing our buildings, you're seeing all the non-releasable birds that are, that are there, but you're not seeing the birds in rehab. And that's, that's a st state law and really a federal law um, when the U.S. Fish and Wildlife get involved. Uh, birds that are being rehabbed, rehabilitated should not be on public view. Um, and uh, in order to release, we wanna do it as soon as possible. Another regulation, we have to have a plan for a bird once we hit a six month mark. So once a bird comes to our facility, the clock starts ticking and at six months, we need to either file a, uh, to put the bird on our, our permit, permanent permit, which would be on our bird walk for public viewing display. We need to relocate the bird to another facility. We obviously best case, we wanna release the bird. Um, and worst case, the bird would have to be euthanized. So if it has an injury that is not going to have, allow it to have a good quality of life, then the bird would, would have to be euthanized. Typically, we don't wait six months. Typically, a decision is made a lot sooner. Um, and it's not, a, it's not a very rash decision. The decision um, is made um, based on, um, you know, the facts as we have them, based on um, what, what the bird is going through. Uh, and it's typically assessed by Dr. Passarelli or Jonathan Handy, who's our wildlife rehabilitator. Um, we want to release birds in the same location if we can, by law, by regulations, it can be within 10 miles. So case in point, we get a brown pelican, or maybe we get three in one day from the Skyway. We're not releasing them on City Island. We don't want to artificially um, increase that population, but we're also not bringing it right back to the Skyway where they can get in some trouble. I'll talk about that in a little bit when we talk about hook and line. We have two gray orange owls here. We do foster care. Our foster care program involves, this year has involved, um, we did not do a gray horned owl, but we did um, two osprey. We did two sandhill uh, crane colts. We did a few screech owls. Um, and a few, we don't count the baby birds. They typically are not foster cared for. Um, but in terms of baby birds, I think we, I think we spiked around 150 or 160. Um, and that baby bird is over, it will start back up. Usually it starts back up in early March, end of February, early March, usually we get a couple of screech owls first, followed by some stand -ho cranes. And then, uh, then non-releasable. Birds would spend their duration or the rest of their life, if you will, on our bird walk. And currently we have 121 or 22 birds on the bird walk representing, I think it was last count was 65 species. And we have two new ones going out uh, later in the week. So a couple fun facts, 100 plus foods uh, are, are expended a day, medicine, supplements. We actually have a full-time person, Tara Morningstar, who's our kitchen manager. And it's amazing what goes into feeding these guys. Um, over a ton of fruit per year, over four tons of seed. I missed one. I think it's something like six to eight uh, tons of rats and mice, over 18 tons of fish per year. Um, we do not rely on um, local fishermen. They did that in the past. I know Pelican Man had some connections, and I think even Lee Fox, who began SOS, uh, had connections. We get all of our fish from um, Armstrong. I'm sorry, Ellsworth up in St. Pete. We get most of our insects from Armstrong, and um, we use a number of different purveyors for the um, rats and mice and that sort of thing. We also we also grow around uh, have our own grow room for rats and mice. We have to give um, any raptors that come in that primarily feed on rodents, we need to give them um, live food to get, keep their um, instincts sharp um, and not uh, impact them in a negative way. Um, we did drop the educate from our tagline and um, it has nothing to do with that we're doing less education. The feeling from the board and, and our marketing committee in particular, and, and I agreed with it was, um, it's a long tagline to begin with, and we wanted to keep the R's in place. So educate, we still do a lot of education, which I'm going to talk about here with the human wildlife conflict. But a lot of what we talk about is prevention. You know, let's let's try to keep the birds out of trouble, right? Uh, we're, we're focusing on the next generation. And um, one of the things I'm doing now, and I'm going to be talking about a lot of different partnerships, is uh, because I came from Moat, I have a really good relationship, not only with Moat itself, uh, and their CEO, Michael Crosby, but also the education department. And one of the cool things about the new aquarium to me is they're going to offer educational programs, of course, at the aquarium. In fact, they're going to have three state-of-the-art STEM labs, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math STEM labs 
Um, but the education team that is in place now doesn't leave. In fact, they're looking at actually increasing the programs because that's where the lab is. It's around, it, it, is, it is the bay, it is, it is the shoreline. Um, the Moat Explorer, I believe, is also going to stay there. There's going to be elements to the other, the, the uh, Marine Mammal Building will have an educational component. There's going to be a visitation component. It's not going to be the aquarium. It's going to be different. Um, in some ways, it might be better. And I think the two will complement um, each other, SOS, as we expand and change and, and same with, um, with Moat. So if that's the first time you heard that, um, good, um, but they're saying that, um, you know, from time to time, and it still remains to be seen to how they're going to roll it out. But we, um, in fact, we, we've done, uh, we shared a Sarasota Bay Estuary grant together this past year. And the goal of that grant was to get um, Title I schools bussed out, buses, the buses are paid for, the programs are paid for, and um, the goal was to have them hit both moat um, uh, exhibits and then come over to SOS and have some of our programs. So it's a win-win. And our goal, of course, is no child left inside. And then there's conversations like I have with my son who says, don't you realize there's an app for all this? And it's true. And this is the struggle we have right now with, with the next generation, the plugged-in generation. I find that uh, my generation was probably the, the what we call the no child left in the woods. Um, we I played outside all the time, you know, and, and was obviously uh, shocked and, and scared to death by catbirds, as I mentioned before. So I want to transition a little bit. Um, I want to talk about the human wildlife conflict. And basically, I want to select a problem. And here's the three problems we have, hook and line, rodenticides, vehicle and collisions, and cats. And we're going to add another collision in there after we spoke earlier. Um, and then I'm going to pose some solutions. So I don't want you to feel, oh, boy, here we go. You know, the world's, you know, fading fast here. Um, but in terms of hook and line, you know, the number one bird we have coming to our facility is the brown pelican. It's about half, half the birds that we have come in. So those 1,200, 550 to 600 are, are brown pelicans. They're getting a lot of trouble. It's, um, they're also a very numerous bird, of course. And uh, fishermen, um, in some cases, have provided, you know, the... Uh, an area where you know they're going to get free food, so they come back. And the young ones, the first year ones, typically fall for it, and they'll go for fish or they'll go after the lines. The more mature ones, um, we find um, figure things out a little bit better. So, for instance, in the Overlook Rehab area, I think I counted uh, earlier today, we had eight immature brown pelicans and only one adult. So that just goes to show you who's getting in trouble. Uh, the Skyway Fishing Pier it's the longest fishing pier in the country. Um, we have a lot of problems with it. It's, it's, um, we have a group up there, friends of the Pelicans, partners of ours who do admirable work, unbelievable work to the point where they could get five or six, uh, Pelicans in, in one day. They have a full-time person now who works five days a week, um, goes up and down the pier, walkie talkies. They're putting out signage. They're having conversations. They're having a dialogue with the fishermen. This is not a fisherman first birder versus wildlife. Most of the fishermen do not want to hook pelicans. You know, most of the fishermen don't realize they're not supposed to cut the line, right? And, and in some cases, they're cutting the line because they don't want their pole, which could be anywhere between, you know, a couple hundred dollars to a couple thousand dollars to get pulled in after. Um, so one of the things we're working on with the fish and wildlife is to try to limit the amount of poles that can be used, use holders for these poles, get rid of multi, uh, multi hooks, multi jigs. Um, and so we're having a dialogue with them. It, it, it is definitely a process. Something will happen in the future because this cannot continue. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty much a slaughter what's going on up there from on, 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 on various days. Right now too, we're in Pelican's season. So this is, this is right before they go into breeding season. Um, they've moved around a little bit from post-breeding dispersal. They're now coming back to the breeding area. Terracea Preserve is right there. Um, so the main thing we can say is don't cut the line. And we actually have a brochure. This may come up backwards. It's um, uh, what to do when you hook a pelican. And we have some signage. I think the previous slide showed a sign. There it is on the right. Not to feed them scraps. 
don't cut it, net it. And most people find it just unfathomable to actually reel in a bird. Um, and you, you can't do that with all birds. I and mean, a right blue heron, I'd be very careful. But at the same time, we don't want you to cut the line. So <clears throat> that's the main thing. Because once you cut the line, you have what's in the bottom there. You have the, the webbing, the netting all around the, the feet of the bird. And oftentimes, they'll go back into the rookery or into the mangroves. And they could either get tangled in other birds. They could hang themselves. Um, and so it's really up to these volunteers who just don't walk the pier. They actually go and they work along the entire um, um, mangroves of, of various areas and paddle out there and, and work with pole saws and, and to cut them down, um, cut the string down. Uh, another one we're dealing with right now, and this is something that uh, Sarasota Audubon is, is supporting Kylie Wilson on. And Kylie, who uh, has been a past volunteer and I think a staff person with SOS, um, we've been working with both the city of Sarasota. I've independently been working with the town of uh, Lombo Key, which I think is probably in the new year going to switch to all their properties being um, um, anti-coagulant rodenticide free. If, and the difference is um, um, something like Rad X, which is in the bottom, is derived from natural um, ingredients. And what it does, it actually instead of an anticoagulant that makes you bleed out. Uh, and, and, and in the process of that, will actually increase the 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 poison load in in a predator like a red-shouldered hawk featured at the top. Um, it can actually increase the the impact on that bird. The the, the Rad X ingredient made by EcoClear, and I'm not a shill for EcoClear or Rad X. It's the main product that's out there. We're using it at SOS. I've convinced Mo to use it. I'm trying to convince the rest of the island um, uh, tenants to use it. What it does is it coats the lining of the stomach and the, the animal doesn't realize it's, it's thirsty. And so over time, if a rat's not drinking two, three, four times um, across, the, across um, a week or so, it will eventually begin to dehydrate, not know it, and it will go into organ failure. And so they eventually kind of wither away. Um, it's it's. I think whenever you're you're using a, a a killing agent for an animal to say, and it's and this is the one that I disagree with. It's it's, it's relatively painless. Well, that being said, I mean it's to us our sanctuary is either going to be overrun by rats. At the same time, we don't want um, red-shouldered hawks who actually actively hunt on on City Island. To be impacted as well. So we're kind of, no pun intended, picking our poison here. Um, we know that the bald eagles the last two years, I shouldn't say we know, but it's it's pretty certain with, with the lack of um, you know pulling the birds down and doing a necropsy, but the bald eagles on Lido, um, which actually got this moving um, and working with, with Kylie and working with the city of Sarasota to actually put some signage up and reach out to the different home associations and the businesses on St. Armand's to use a better product, become knowledgeable. So everyone's homework uh, or New Year's resolution, if you have wrap boxes on your property, in your condo, um, find out who's who's keeping them, um, who's doing the up, upkeep of those and find out what's in it and have them tell you exactly what the brand is. Um, reach out to me or Kylie or, or um, you can look it up online and, and if they're not using something along the lines of Radex or product from EcoClear, it's probably not Home Depot or a Lowe's it can be purchased online, um, as can the boxes. So I, I, I do urge you to, to become informed and, and empowered and, and find out you know, if you can make a difference in that. Um, same thing with collisions. Uh, we're going to talk about three. I only had two here, vehicles and glass strikes. Vehicles, of course, um, we're very fortunate to live in, in Florida where we, at, we have natural sandhill crane populations. Uh, the problem is sandhill cranes haven't evolved quick enough to deal with the amount of traffic. I mean, just in the last few years, uh, there's areas in Lakewood Ranch where there were basically prairie almost and farmland and they were nesting across the street from my son's school, for instance. Um, and the thing with cranes is they will typically fly away or run in front of the car at the last minute, thinking you're going to stop or thinking 
what what am I doing? Why why would this car hit me? That's probably the the thing going through their their mind. Um, but we get other birds, owls, which have the fixed owl fixed eyes in the front when they're facing a predator. If you're going down a dark road and you know that, especially as birders, we should know certain owl habitats. Just maybe not speed down that so so fast and and just just be alert for an owl coming across the the the, um, the, the roadway. Uh, same with waterfowl. There's uh, especially when you have uh, chicks walking along. You know, there's a pond. You've seen you've seen black belly whistling ducks or wood ducks or or model ducks, you name it, drive a little slower, be cautious. Um, glass strikes, um, this is this is typically one where I think especially new construction, you can be, you can be, you can have the design where you can have slats put in your windows, you can have a film or a tint put in. Um, you can retro, you can put different uh, stickers on, of course, different patterns, you can put the blinds down. Um, if you get a, a bird, like a, whether it's a morning dove or a cardinal, strike your window um, the first time. It's probably not the first time. It's probably happened before, and you might see a little imprint of, an, of, of a bird uh, silhouette. Um, so be, be a little bit more aware, more cognizant of, of what's going on. I think the Nature Center, too, has a lot of these decals, if I'm not mistaken, that you, could, you can buy to prevent uh, bird strikes. And the third one, um, I'm a golfer. I'm not, ever since I moved to Florida though, I haven't golfed as much. I think the, the birding's too good and I haven't <laughs> had rather bird for three or four hours than go golfing. But um, if you're a golfer, also be aware. You're, you're about to you know, uh, hit one down the, the range and um, um, make sure there's no sandhill cranes or geese. Um, I know a lot of the golfers, I've heard them uh, before they know who I work for, uh, mention how they they try to hit the can of the geese on Lombo, and, I, and I'm thinking, why? What's the point? I mean, that goose didn't do anything to you. And the fact that a can of the goose lives in Florida, I think, is pretty amazing. So, um, just again, be aware, be aware of your surroundings. Um, I'm not trying to be anti-golf at all, not at all at all. But um, and I can't say this enough. Um, I'm personally very allergic to cats, but in our office. Our staff of, I think there's currently 12 of us, I think nine of us, nine on the staff have cats. So we are cat lovers. And actually when Maria does a similar presentation, she actually has a picture of everyone's cats just to show that we're not anti-cat and pro-bird. You can be both. And um, if you want, we can get an interactive here. Uh, in the U.S., blank birds are killed by domestic or feral cats each year. People want to just reply in the chat. Go ahead. Wait a few, uh, wait about 10 seconds or so. See if we have any guesses. I got a 10,000. Pretty good guess. We got a couple question marks from Suzanne. Well, it's slightly more than 10,000. Oh, what's that one, Jeff? You didn't put any commas. So one, two, three. Is that a million? A million's a pretty good guess. It, it's more though. I read 19 million. It's actually, oh, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, billion. And that's brought to you by the American Bird Conservancy. The 1.5, um, these are models that they did. And the 4 billion is basically if everyone's house cat and um, the feral cats were really that good. Um, the belief, though, is it's somewhere between 1.5 and 2 billion. Um, it's amazing, and and I think year after year after year, how can we how can we lose this many songbirds? Because that's really what they're going after. Uh, there's 100 million feral cats in the U.S. That was uh, that's from about two years ago, and the number of domestic cats has tripled in the last 40 years. So the only thing I'm going to say here, the public service announcement, and I've heard it from everybody. I had a boss up in New York who used to say. Eh, my cat's a great cat. My cat likes to go outside. It looks at the birds. My cat would never go after a bird until the day he did go after a bird. And then he went after another bird. And then he finally realized I can't let the cat out anymore. So those are the, those are the birds that he, 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 he saw the cat get. And that, that's not what we're leaving on the table here, all the mammals. Think of all the mammals, the moles, the voles, uh, the, the, in some cases, um, well, obviously the, the, the mice. But these are rodents that our birds of prey need. 
and they they depend on during during the uh, uh, cooler seasons. Um, so switching gears, I want to talk about uh, SOS. This is this is a quote from Robert O'Hara, who's one of our um, he's one of our inspectors that comes through um, once a year, once or twice a year. They usually do an annual inspection. They'll do a surprise inspection. Um, we are an older facility, so there are things we are grandfathered in for. When this quote precedes me taking the helm at SOS, but when I saw him and I I, I, I referenced this quote, he goes, it is, it is the model. Your protocols, you you, you know, you now hired a vet, um, your release, your, your, you know, the, your prescriptions, everything that you have in terms of uh, um, how you run the facility is fantastic. It's when you, when your facility can become uh, more modernized then that's even better. So we appreciated that um, he, he, he sees what we're up against. And to be honest, it all began with Pelican Man. So established in 1989, we're using a lot of the same facilities that he built. And the story of the Pelican Man goes back really to 1981. And he had just recently retired. He'd moved to Sarasota. He was a car salesman. Um, he was starting a second life, if you will, uh, with a second family. And he was out fishing one day and he saw a juvenile brown pelican struggling at the base of the old Ringling Bridge. And he put it over there and he, and he saw that it was tangled up in fishing line and had some hooks in it. And uh, he, he grabbed it, put it in his boat and he went back to his home. He lived on uh, Golden Gate and he, he, called, uh, he called the city and he said, what do I do? Who do I call? Do you, you guys take injured pelicans? And they said, no, no, we don't. Um, it's a pelican. Oh, you better call the state. That's a state state um, protected species. So he called the state, called FWC, and they said, no, 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 brown pelican. That, that's that's an endangered, federally endangered. Call the feds. And the feds said, no, 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 the California has got the federally endangered. So you see what was going on here. And so finally he called a veterinarian and he told them the story and the vet kind of laughed. And this is also 1981, the Wildlife Rehabilitation Network. There, there, there wasn't a network. There were rehabbers kind of in different areas. This is pre-internet. So the veterinarian said, listen, I can walk you through it. He told them how to take the hook out, how to cut it, how to make sure the barb didn't re-enter and uh, un undid the fishing line. And he had it in his bathtub and he was able to release it a few days later. We call this somewhat of a catch and release. But what happened was he, he, he kept in this retired life, he kept going out. He saw an injured gopher tortoise along the side of the road. So over the course of the next six, seven years, he's doing this in his in his home, in his in his in his bathroom, in his in his in his uh, garage. And so finally, some um, some friends encouraged him. You know, you you should ask the city to give you. You're doing the city's work. You're doing something no one else does. And this is what nonprofits do. We we make a niche. And so the city said, you know, we've got some property next to Moat Marine. Um, you know, but you know, could you raise some money to, you know, build what you need? We don't, we, we'll let you, we'll let you have it for, I think it was $3 a year. And, and they did. And he slowly started building some, some aviaries and different enclosures. He did, he did more than birds. He did wildlife. Like I said, he had some squirrels and he had a raccoon and he had different, uh, he had gopher tortoises. But um, what happened was Freight Magazine got wind of what was going on here and they had a story on him. The story broke nationally and people just started sending him checks. So he was able to buy things like this red pickup. He bought three of them. So he had rescue people going out do you think he's north, too long? east, and south. And um, uh, within another year, 1990, President Bush named him one of the thousand points of light, which was highlighting the volunteerism in America, one of his uh, pillars in his uh, presidency. And so again, more money came in our buildings were built, uh, our buildings, uh, our office and our hospital were built in 1992 and in 1993 in the winter. And then the, the muse that you see along the road. Um, unfortunately, uh, Dale Pelican Man passed away in 2003. The facility held on for another three years. It was really poorly run. It eventually closed due to, due, due to uh, financial worries and uh, it laid dormant for about 18 months. And the city, put out a request for proposals and they said you know we, we want someone to come back and and you know use what's left here you, know, you have to cut through the jungle of course uh which is what they did and the woman who did that on the left is lee fox and lee was running the pinellas um seabird 
Seabird, uh, Pinellas Seabird Rescue Center, um, uh, right near St. Pete Beach, not too far from the current um, Seabird, I always say it, the wrong name, Seacoast Seabird Sanctuary. And while she was there, the woman on the left, uh, Ann Anderson, said, oh, this is wonderful. I've just moved here and I'm a nature lover and, and I, would, I would love to get involved, but I don't know if I can swing a machete. <laughs> and Lee, who I've never met, but uh, and some of you may have, Lee turned and said, if you want to help, the city needs $30,000 for me to open this place up. I don't know. I still haven't figured that out. No one the city's told me why. I don't know if there were, if the, uh, the Pelican Man was in the rears or with the city or something. And she went home, talked to her husband and said, I want to do this. I want to help these, this, this uh, organization. And she did. She became a board member. She, she co-founded it with Lee. And then uh, a few years late, later, the, the gentleman to her on her right, um, was uh, David Pilston was hired and he became the first CEO. Uh, Lee was the executive director and um, like oil and, and water, they didn't mix very well. And, and Lee decided um, to, to, to leave. There's a little bit more to that story how she left, but I don't think that's a, a topic for this talk. Um, Lee is Aaron, I think we need to County. start to wrap up a little bit. Okay. So thank you. All right. Um, and then present day, we have Maria Passarelli was hired in uh, 2020. Um, there's her credentials. One thing I want to I want to say though is she's a um, put together a fantastic internship program. And Evan Powers, who if you know Don and Karen Schneider, that's her grandson, and Andy's great uh, ne uh, nephew. Uh, he was a fantastic intern, and we're averaging about now four interns a year. Um, some of the facilities I want to just briefly touch on. Uh, this is not what our facility is going to look exactly like, but it's very similar. Uh, this is from Pelican Harbor, which is down in Miami, a uh, facility they've created. And we're looking to do a similar thing with a hospital on the first floor, offices on the second, and have an open terrace to uh, release birds, have events, educational things, that sort of thing. And then uh, a modern facility. We currently don't have a surgical suite. We currently don't have the capacity for an x-ray machine. Um, improving our transition pens, moving away from wood and using more of a metal and steel. Here's a, a look of what our bird walk will look like. And our model aviary is slated to begin construction um, early next year, probably late January, early February which will give people a sense of what we're looking to expand to. Uh, one of the holdovers from David's plan in, in 2019 is a Skimmer Sands Playscape, um, which have funding for, and that would go down near the water next to an educational amphitheater, which would be flood um, preventative, if you will, with a nice look at the skyline of Sarasota. That is the view from City Island from the back of our sanctuary. And I apologize, I, I ran a little long, but there you go. And happy to take questions if there's time. Well, thank you very much. This is very, very informative on so many different levels. Um, if, do people have questions? They can put them in the chat. Um, I, I have a question. Um, maybe it was just my uh, computer, but you got a bit garbled around um, what is, I mean, there's to me, no rat poison is a good rat poison, but is there one that we should be, uh, is, is better than the rest? Could you say that again, if you don't mind? I could put it yeah. in the chat also. Yeah, it's called, um, the brand name is Rat X, R-A-T-X. And it's made by, I believe it's called EcoClear. Um, and they make a, a number of different um, different, I don't want to say poisons, but that's what they are, um, that are, that are somewhat eco-friendly. So that's relatively speaking, a good one to use. It is. It's what the city of Sarasota uses. Um, it's what uh, a group out of, of Tampa called Safe Harbor is advocating for. Um, you're going to see 
more momentum in the next year, not only with SOS, um, possibly with, with you guys, with Audubon. I think Audubon Florida should be taking this up as well, you know, especially their facility in, in um, uh, near Orlando. Great, thank you. See Lou, Lou Newman had a question. Are you seeing birds affected by red tide? We, we are, um, it's not at the rate that we saw in, in 2018, nor is it the rate we saw last year, um, but we're, they're definitely coming in. Yeah, they're coming in, but I, I think at the most we've had to date is probably maybe 12. And I think of those maybe four expired. So if we can get them quick enough, we can get them on fluids and antibiotics, we, we can usually um, turn the tide, so to speak. Uh, yeah, the white pelicans are, are high because they've had two really good breeding years up north. You know, they are true snowbirds. Um, so they're, they're, th this year's population is, is much bigger than last year's, in my opinion, just anecdotally. I think, I think eBird would, would attest to that as well. Um, yep. And do they ever catch the person who is scalping pelicans on the scale? I, I don't know. I'm not, that would be a question for the friends of the pelican. I can look into that though. Um, Jean has a Holly, question, Jean. Um, oh yeah, go ahead. So Aaron, so if we find a bird and, and um, can we call you, I generally call Venice Wildlife because I believe at one point in the past, um, mm -hmm. Save Our Seabirds didn't send out uh, rescuers, but are they doing that now? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you, you can, you, you can definitely call us. What we'll do is, is, is work with them if, if it's a better fit for them. And what I mean by that is um, we share some of the rescuers, David and Linda Ganass, for instance, will rescue the same days for sa the same organizations. If we reach out to Linda to come out and get, let's say it's a sandhill crane, or let's say it's a, we'll, we'll assess based on the species and based on what our rescue volunteers are up to. Uh, I know when 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 David uh, was CEO, it was a it was a little different um, uh, feeling of of how our rescue volunteers were asked to do certain things. So I'll just mm -hmm. leave it at that. Um, my feeling is, and we've also increased the number of volunteers, both in East County, and we're expanding in Lakewood Ranch. So where we're going to expand will be in Manatee County, Northeastern Manatee County, or I'm sorry, um, Southeastern Manatee County. Um, Venice is, is very fine covering Southern Sarasota County. So you guys are in the middle. So a bird that's at the celery fields, it may be quicker to shoot up the interstate. To get that bird and bring it back to them because they're not far from the interstate down there where they are in venice um so it's all about time of day and what the species is and what our volunteers can actually do so there's a little bit going on behind the scenes but when in doubt call both of us and we can figure it out okay what is your telephone number our number is 941-388-3010 say that again please 941-388-3010. Okay. So to all of our people who are listening and watching, it would be a good idea to put that right into your cell phone. And that's uh, all, because we do get calls at the Nature Center. Who do we call? Who do we call? But if you have that in your cell phone, then you've got that number right away. And as Aaron said, if he, if they, if Save Our Seabirds can't, um, rescue the bird, they will refer you to Venice Wildlife. So that's great, thank you. I'm There's putting mine in right now. <laughs> There's there a go. question, what is your current budget and are you self-sustaining? Very good question. Um, yeah, our, our, our budget this, this cycle um, was about 860,000 uh, for revenue. Um, we are going to slightly exceed that and our, our expenses we did it we did a um we did a budget where not quite break even because we had to pay back a little bit of money that we spent out of the reserves during, during the covid years 
Um, so our expenses were about 740. Next year, we're boosting everything up to about 975. We're not quite ready to be a million dollar organization. Um, and that does not include the capital projects. That's, that's a separate account. Uh, it will be reported in the audit, of course. Uh, you, can, you can look at any of our financials at savercbirds.org. I think our financials are, are there up to 2021. Um, we are self-sustaining. Um, we rely 100% on contributions. People will say, you don't get any money from the, from the state. And I say, yeah, we do when I write a grant and um, we have to do a lot for it. Um, but uh, one cool thing about the state funding this past year was the legislature passed the full budget for one of, the, one of our programs. So typically we apply for 90,000 and we, got, we, we would get 45. This year we're getting the full 90. So that's, that's, a, that's not the governor necessarily, but it's, it's the legislature who approved that and he did not veto it. So I guess you can, you can give credit to both. So I have another question about the hurricane. How did you all fare during the hurricane and how hurricane protected are you uh, <laughs> knowing what happened in poor Lee County? Yeah, um, we, we, we were shut down for 27 days, mainly because we had um, four large ficus trees fell down and, and our Sandhill Crane enclosure, which is the largest enclosure we have was was damaged beyond repair. Our brown pelicans uh, were damaged. They were moved off site. So when we reopened uh, for another two weeks, they weren't on public display, which was very eerie because here we are with, it, with our logo. Uh, you couldn't see a brown pelican. Um, in terms of revenue, I mean, we don't charge. So therefore being closed, we didn't lose any money. So um, in terms of as a board and, 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 and myself as a leader of the organization, we had a, a real gut check, you know, do we want to stay where we are, even though we have a 35 year lease left with the city. Um, what if what happened in Sanibel happened to us and unanimously we decided to stay and we've redone our hurricane protocol. Uh, we didn't move any birds off island, except two that were in um, need of medicine uh, during the storm. What we did was two thirds of the birds, about 80 of them were put up in our hospital. So if anything had happened in the hospital, something's happened to those birds. So our new protocol now with a storm of uh, in excess of uh, um, a cat two, we will move majority, if not all the birds off, off the facility. And we're looking to work with one of the cargo holds at the airport at SRQ. Um, which would be probably running on a generator because it's on the hospital grid or, or at least be on that grid or not the hospital, the, um, the, the airport. So um, it, it kind of, it spooked us, but it didn't scare us off. So we're gonna- Bravo, bravo. <laughs> so any more questions? I think, um, I think we're, thank you so much. This is just full of a pack with such important information. Um, and uh, please consider uh, donating generously to uh, Sarasota Audubon and to Save Our Seabirds. So um, coming up in January on the 9th, we have uh, an incredible speaker from Australia. Uh, Tim Lowe is very well known there. Uh, he's going to be talking about where song began. And I asked him to talk when I read a fascinating article he had written in one of the birding magazines about what dinosaurs, Australian birds, and South America have in common. And you would be amazed that there is uh, everything in common. I've been trying forever to get us a, a speaker on bird dinosaurs. And here we've got Australian birds and even uh, how they ended up, songbirds ended up in South America. And um, uh, in preparation for his talk, he, he is a really good speaker. Um, you might want to get his book, uh, the seventh one published by Yale University Press called Where Song Began. And, and he's, we, we've had him scheduled for a year and he's very excited to be on Zoom and to speak to us all. 
So we'll see you January 9th. And in the meantime, have a wonderful holiday season. And thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you, Aaron. It was a wonderful presentation. It caught us up with SOS again. And uh, you do wonderful work out there. We really rely thank upon you. you. And uh, thank you for coming. And happy holidays to everybody. Uh, many of you I will see tomorrow at the holiday lunch, and I look forward to that. And uh, for those that I'm not seeing again, by the end of the year, have a wonderful holiday. Thank you and good night. Bye, all. Okay.